So the big news this week, probably the big news any week, whatever week you happen to be watching this, comment on the news without being tied directly to it simply by acknowledging that the news repeats over and over and over again, the same damn stories over and over again. And we always regard them as being something new. But the big news this week is someone behaved badly. The bad behavior was made public. And the public corrected that bad behavior with even worse behavior. This is moral philosophy in the uh, age of bread and circuses. Bread and circuses right now is affected on Twitter, but there's bread and circuses somewhere, everywhere. Somehow or another, there is, are some means for people to soil themselves in the act of uh, slinging mud at other people. And that is what happened this week. A TV reporter behaved badly on um a video camera that she didn't know was there. The video was released, and uh, millions of people demonstrated their uh, superior moral understanding through exhibitions of complete lack of morality, behaving far worse than did the TV reporter in the first place. She was exercised. She was provoked. Um, she was out of control, but she had reasons for being out of control. Not to say that they were justified, but they were there in any case. The people who in turn attacked her had no reason whatever to attack her. Didn't know she existed the day before, have forgotten about her by now, but in the meantime they have soiled themselves enduringly in an act of mob vengeance. This is not to be celebrated, and it only warrants being commented upon in order to throw it away, to put it in the trash where it belongs. And so I would like to highlight the news that you didn't notice this week, the news that perhaps only I noticed this week, or me and a few other people, because we are of that uh, frame of mind. And my particular frame of mind is um, seeking evidences of the efficacy of the human mind, even as human beings uh, seem to devote all of their energies to proving to me that they are fundamentally mindless. I know they're not. I know that mindless behavior is caused, and the causes are fully explicated in Man Alive. The reasons why, particularly chapters 9 and 10, nine, chapter 9 in particular, why people behave in this mindless fashion. Um, earlier this week, I reposted a essay I wrote Recently, having rewritten an essay, uh, essay I wrote um, on the order of eight years ago about cultivating indifference, how to cultivate indifference in the midst of these kind of um, bread and circuses, Twitter wars. But the good news that I would uh, like to highlight this week, that you may consider it a matter of complete trivia, but I think it's important, I think it's significant, is that um, Alex Jacob, a young currency trader, who lives in Chicago, former poker professional, um, is kicking ass on Jeopardy with a brand new strategy, a substantial improvement on the Arthur Chu strategy, which was the first new strategy in Jeopardy in the 50-year history of the game. The Jeopardy has been around since, I think, 1964, maybe longer than that. Jeopardy has been on TV since I was aware of television. I'm not an old, old man, but I'm 55 years old, and for at least 50 years, Jeopardy has been on television because I've always been aware of it being on television. I grew up with Jeopardy on television. Jeopardy used to be much harder than it is now, so you should never encourage anyone my age or um, relatively older than you to opine on Jeopardy, and they will tell you how weak Jeopardy is today compared to what it was then. The quality of the contestants seems to me to be weaker. The relative strength of the contestants seems to be weaker, but of course the real difference is the um, academic preparation of the audience. The Jeopardy is written for the audience, not for the contestants, not for the host, not for the advertisers in particular. It's written for the audience. It's written to attract the biggest possible audience, and you have to attract an audience, you have to convince them that they're smart for watching Jeopardy. That's Jeopardy is the great big vid Jeopardy that rewards INTJ high C's in particular, INTP high C's in general, people who regard um, the vast collections of arcane and useless facts as being evidence of an education. It is evidence of a type of education, but it is not evidence of an education. As you can readily see, as soon as you take a fact-laden Poindexter and invite him to change a tire in the rain, um, 
diagnose an engine failure, build a shelter. The INTJ High C Poindexter academic style of education has its uses and its benefits, but it is not comprehensive and um if we educated our surgeons in the way that academics think that we should educate everyone else, no academic would survive heart surgery. Unfortunately, we don't do that. But in any case, Jeopardy um, has been around a long, long time, and whether or not it's harder now than it was before, harder before than it was now, it is um, the standard by which we judge um, that sort of high, uh, high C intellectual attainment. It is... Uh, the the salt on the table that distinguishes the above the salt from the below the salt among people who regard themselves as being educated. If you do not consistently take a stab at Jeopardy questions, right or wrong, if you're not consistently competing with the contestants on the television, then you'll watch another show because Jeopardy won't be satisfying to you. But um, Arthur Chu came along. This is on the order of two or three years ago. I didn't look this up, but... Um, came along and completely revolutionized the game of Jeopardy by recognizing a much, much better strategy for playing. That if you walk up to do the uh, Family Feud quiz and walk up to 100 people and say, what's the absolute best strategy for winning on Jeopardy? A substantial number of people, 80% or better, would say study lots and lots of trivia, which has always been the strategy for winning on Jeopardy. And the people who are most impressive, the Tournament of Champions types who come back are um, amazingly uh, broad, deep knowledge of arcane trivia. Um, they would win every bar bet, except they're not the type who go to bars in general. That's been the strategy for winning on Jeopardy, and then Arthur Chu came along and completely revolutionized the game. The Arthur Chu strategy consisted of dominating the high-value questions in the softer categories, in categories that uh, Chu felt very confident in, um, in order to run up his own score while he was fishing for daily doubles, which are typically lower on the board in the higher value questions, all of which um, serve to forestall late rallies. So Chu would select seemingly at random, but really he was picking from um, softer categories, but taking the lower down value questions, the questions with the higher dollar value, um, in order to get the, the money by answering the question correctly, a secondary benefit of this is by risking the high value questions, even if he chooses not to buzz in on them, he's putting the other players at huge risk. They could substantially run up their score, but they also could lose a lot of money really quickly. And in, lose a lot, in losing a lot of money, become more intimidated, intimidated and this more um, risk averse in their own style of play. Um, but what he was really up to was fishing for the daily doubles because they're lower on the board, um, grabbing more daily doubles than anybody had ever done before. The, the presumably random distribution, no, they're not distributed at random, and um, if you fish for them, you'll find them. And so by fishing for the daily doubles, he assured that he would get them. He ran up his score hugely in the early parts of the game, um, and at the same time, when other players would get around to the fact that they really needed to rally and start buzzing in on questions, they would be buzzing in on the low-value questions. So even if they made a rally toward the end of a particular round of play, they would be playing for lower dollar amounts and they wouldn't be able to catch up to him. It was a brilliant strategy. He killed on the game. He killed on the game. Trebek, Alex Trebek, the host, hated him because Alex Trebek is a um, great celebrant of mediocrity. He is uh, the champion mediocrity of Jeopardy, the second best host Jeopardy ever had. There having been two. Um... And um, you see him every time there is a truly superior player on Jeopardy. You see his uh, his envy and his malice toward the good players. And um, that envy and malice is echoed in a whole lot of Jeopardy fans. They hated Chu. Many Jeopardy fans hated Chu, Chu when he was on the show, and many hate him since then. And when um, other exponents of the Chu strategy show up, there are snarky remarks about them, and you can see that Trebek is unhappy to see the Chu strategy played, even though um, people who showed up on Jeopardy since then to play the Chu strategy haven't really understood it all that well. They haven't played it all that well. They've only understood pieces of it, or they're not willing to really fully commit to it. The interesting thing about the Chu strategy is that Chu himself was fully committed to it 
pursued it relentlessly, understood it was a better strategy. My guess is that he studied Jeopardy for quite a while, maybe played a whole lot of dummy games, or maybe played along with the show and really scored himself so he could see how he was doing. Um, but he was fully committed to the strategy, and most of the people who showed up since then are not until this week when Alex Jacob, actually last Friday was his first appearance on Jeopardy, so he's played six games so far. He's made an enormous amount of money in those six games. Um, and he has arrived with a substantial improvement on the Chu strategy. Um, the Jacob strategy consists of the Chu strategy supplemented by an affected table image, and we'll come back to the idea of table image, um, but an affected table image um, that, in turn, supplemented by rushing the action or delaying the action, um, deliberately screwing around with the timing of the game, the natural pace of the game that Trebek wants to put on it, the pace that others expect, and the pace that the audience expects. Um, so rushing and delaying the action um, at exactly the wrong times, as it were. Um, and unlike Chu, um, deliberately guessing on answers, a measured inferential guessing in the Chu strategy. Chu didn't guess or seemingly didn't guess. And so if he selected a question that he did not know the answer to, he did not buzz in um, and did, therefore didn't risk his winnings, that the Chu strategy was aimed at winning only, accumulating cash only, um, and not risking it by buzzing in in order to guess, which is a common strategy on Jeopardy, buzzing in in anticipation of knowing the answer. Again, we're dealing with trivia freaks, INTJ high C's, with massive memories for incredibly useless trivial knowledge. And so there's a lot of guessing among good players on Jeopardy. Jacob doesn't guess that way. He, ha he does have a good knowledge. He's got a very good education, a very broad, deep knowledge of useless detail, but his guessing is inferential in the sense that he's second-guessing the writers. And remember, the writers are writing for the audience, not the contestant, not the contestants. And so when Jacob is in a situation where he needs to guess, the guesses that he makes are based on an understanding of what an ordinary, well-educated person could be expected to know. This is the basis of his inference, is what would a person who watches Jeopardy by preference know? What would he not know? And his, infer his inferences are based on what the audience members would know, based on what the writers would have chosen in anticipation that the audience members would know it. And Viewed as a Jeopardy strategy, this is killer anyway. The Chu strategy was a pure Jeopardy strategy, and it was a killer strategy, much better than anything that had come before it. But the Jacob strategy is more than a Jeopardy strategy. It's really a poker strategy. And so I want to go back through the Jacob elements again. First, we said it's Chu plus an affected table image. Table image is an idea from poker that... I have a certain natural style of play. If I play just as my ordinary, authentic personality, I'm going to come across like this. I've done the disc of poker. I can show what the authentic behavior of people is and therefore what their typical bluffing behavior will be. It's easy to figure out. It's just the opposite, the diametrical opposite of their ordinary disc strategy is their bluffing strategy. But taking account of that, that it is easy enough for a skilled poker player to figure out both your natural table image and your affected table image, a skilled poker player will go one better and come up with a completely affected table image so that you cannot possibly guess what's going on. The, the big example of this from televised poker is Gus Hansen, who many people saw the World Poker Tournament, the World Series, whatever. I think the World Poker Tournament is where he really stood out. Um, and he was a wild man. He would play any two cards. You had no idea what cards he was playing. Stu Unger, who um, was one of the first re truly great, amazingly great, insanely reliably great poker players, often would not even look at his down cards and hold them. He would bet raise against cards that he's, he'd never even looked at, and this would drive the other players at the, cra uh, at the table crazy. This is how you put other players on tilt. Um, that's really the purpose of the table image, is to put everyone else on tilt to the point where they cannot possibly guess what you're doing, but they insist on trying anyway. And they spend so much time trying to figure out what you're doing that they don't think about what's the best thing for them to do. That's the advantage of putting a player on tilt. And this is what Jacob is doing. 
So he starts off with an affected table image. He um, affects to have Asperger's syndrome. Essentially, he, he gives a very convincing demonstration of a high-functioning um, autism case, Asperger's syndrome, the syndrome that we associate with INTJ high C's who are um, completely incapable of normal social interaction. Sheldon Cooper is the character on Big Bang Theory is based on this, although he's not really all that Asperger. Um, but Jacob is not either. I watched videos of him um, from poker tournaments. He's um, tournament poker, poker professional, hasn't played in a few years, but has $2.6 million in winnings, and there are videos of him on YouTube. I watched the videos. He's a normal Gen Y, millennial, born in 1984, INTJ, high C, um, Jewish, intellectual, grew up in a very booky, bookish, reedy, you know, high academic achieving home. Um, has a lot of INTJ high C social characteristics, you know, social shyness, awkwardness, but um, completely normal millennial male um, is not Asperger's at all. And yet if you watch his Jeopardy performances, you would, you would think that he might well be. He stands with his hands in his pockets. He seems to have a thousand, years, thousand yard stare, very limited facial expressions. As I said, his timing is affected. He's frequently rushing the action, often rushing Alex Trebek to his annoyance, which is fun. He's got Alex Trebek on tilt. Um, but he rushes the action, and in rushing the action, of course, he's putting all the other players on tilt because they're not ready, they're not prepared. That little half-second delay, that little pause, that little bit of silence is the time that people need to prepare, and Jacob's not letting them prepare. He's rushing, rushing, rushing until it's his turn to act, and then very frequently he introduces long delays that make it seem like he's going to blow the question or he's going to get it wrong and then he'll get it right just at the last instance. And this is often, this is the times when he's engaged in this inferential guessing. This is a, essentially the same strategy that Watson, the IBM computer that played Jeopardy, would use, would be um, to run a whole bunch of searches and then um, take the highest probability answer from the searches. And that's what he's doing is sorting through his head of his experience of reasonably well-educated people and what they know and don't know, or maybe watching Jeopardy for many hundreds of episodes to see how the writers think, to see what the writers do. Um, the crossword clue, double clue, Jeopardy clues, they're all the way through because Jeopardy has been so dumbed down since the Art Fleming days that there are so many clues that, like a crossword puzzle or an acrostic clue, offer two potential ways of sussing out the answer um, this is going to contribute to his guessing strategy also, but this timing, rushing and delaying, um, he's fishing for daily doubles like Chu, and often when he gets them, he bets only $100. If he's not confident that he can win a whole lot, often he will do a full daily double, including, you know, doing it with incredible amounts of money, not 2000 but 4000 8000 doubling it up, poker style. But at the same time, if he's not confident about the category, he'll bet $100. This, again, is going to drive the other players crazy because they're dying for that opportunity and they can't stand the thought of blowing it. The inferential guessing, the delayed guessing, um, all of this stuff is putting the players on tilt, putting the other players on tilt. It puts Trebek on tilt. It's putting everybody on tilt. It's putting Twitter on tilt to, to the extent that they're that they're noticing. There are a few people like me who are really thrilled to see something new on Jeopardy and a whole bunch of people who can't stand it because he's kicking ass in a way that they didn't think of. And just exactly the same way they resented Chu for kicking ass in a way that they hadn't thought of. Everybody until Chu thought that winning Jeopardy meant mastering trivia. Chu understood that winning Jeopardy meant mastering Jeopardy. And so he didn't play trivia, he played Jeopardy. He played that game. He understood the game of Jeopardy as game theory. Jacob is playing Jeopardy, is winning Jeopardy by beating the other players. That his own performance has been excellent, both in terms of his mastery of his particular style of play, which is 100% affected. This is as affected as Gus Hansen's table image in poker, it is all there to put the other players on tilt, and he is pursuing this strategy perfectly. And by putting the other players on tilt, his own shortcomings, to the extent that he has intellectual shortcomings, are minimized, and their shortcomings, to the extent that they have them, are magnified. He is kicking ass at this game by beating the other players. I don't know that he can win 145 games in a row or whatever is the 
the trivia master record, but he has changed the game of Jeopardy forever by coming up with a much better way of playing the game, by coming up with a better strategy. Chu came up with a better strategy, and Jacob has improved upon the Chu strategy remarkably. The Chu scaled the game once, and Jacob has scaled it a second time, and this is good news. This is wonderful. And this is the sort of news that you can latch onto and apply very easily in your own life. Today is April 19th, 2015. Today is Patriot's Day. Today is the anniversary of the Battle of Lexington Concord, the first victory in the American Revolution. That's why Patriot's Day is important. They run the Boston Marathon on this day when it's convenient for um, the union members who are paid to celebrate, celebrate Patriot's Day by taking the day off. Patriot's Day is also um, the anniversary of the bombing of the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City 20 years ago today. You will hear about that on the news if you watch the news today, but Patriot's Day is also the anniversary of the siege at Waco under Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton and Janet Reno are the uh, desperados responsible for this massacre. happened on Patriot's Day. You won't see that on the news. But the anniversary of Waco and all of the dreadful, awful news that came this week in addition to our uh, discovery of moral philosophy by betraying it, all of that calls into question the strategy that people have pursued so far for uh, regaining political liberty in the United States. I I'm not... Um, sanguine about libertarians, my fellow anarchists, conservatives, libertarian conservatives, the Tea Party, blah, blah, blah. I do not believe that uh, liberty, will be, liberty will be restored in the United States as a consequence of indoctrination. I don't think that there is a, a soapbox big enough, a book unreadable enough, or a megaphone loud enough for you to shout down Marxism with rhetoric. But I think that's a poor strategy anyway, that if we look at the game the way that the Marxists want us to look at it, then we'll fight just the way we're fighting right now. Uh, rah, 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 patriotism, and we're preaching only to the choir. No one is converted. If we think like Albert Chu, in, or sorry, Arthur Chu, and um, look at the game as it really is, rather than we insist it must be, then we can arrive at better strategies for changing minds. Um, and that's the sort of thing that I was talking about last week with respect to marriage. On Monday, I wrote a post um, linking to last week's church service, um, but noting that the absolute best date night for a married couple, a date night that's really going to be a good date, there's going to be a lot of alone time, a lot of together time, a lot of bonding time, and it's probably going to result in really, really great sex when you get home, is for the two of you to go to the shooting range for target practice. This is a wonderful date night, and as I said, it's, if you're really good as a couple, you'll be very good as a couple at the range, and you'll go home and you'll be very good as a couple with your clothes off. It will make your marriage stronger. But if you are interested in promoting the philosophy of political liberty, what you need is not people who have read Jefferson or have read Hayek or have read Ayn Rand or have uh, mastered this doctrine or that dogma. Um, what you need is a stronger middle class, and you get a stronger middle class by having stronger families, and you get stronger families by having healthier marriages, and you get healthier marriages by having serious, dedicated, committed, hoplite Greek husbands and fathers. That the path to political liberty in the United States and everywhere will be forged, will be, I don't know the word for cutting a path, the path to liberty will be paved proved and paved by men, by committed men, men who are committed to being husbands and fathers. And if you're looking to promote the political liberty that you're looking for, what you should be doing is organizing date nights at shooting ranges. If you want to be a political organizer, that's the way to do it, is to think strategically 
like Arthur Chu and play the game that you're really, really playing and think even more strategically like Alex Jacob and understand the people that you're playing with. You're not trying to defeat them the way he's doing. You're trying to help them get better. And the way that you help them get better is by helping them manifest the values that express the political theory, moral philosophy that you're trying to promote. Better ideas don't make better people. Better people have better ideas. This is a great week for better ideas, despite the bad ideas we saw in too many public displays, including thousands and millions of people demonstrating they lack, my, lack morality by presuming to lecture someone else on their bad behavior. As bad as all of that might seem, nevertheless, there's Alex Jacob showing us that 50-year-old problems, 500-year-old problems, 5,000-year-old problems can be solved by new and better thinking. How cool is that? My name is Greg Swan. This is the Church of Splendor. You can find out more about my thinking at selfadoration.com. If you go to a link called I Don't Go to Your Church, you have an opportunity to give money to this church. I don't understand why more people don't do that. I don't understand why people who are taking big risks in the world don't come to me with questions because I think about things the way that nobody ever thought them before thought about them before. I have a completely different take on everything, and I think that should make me very, very popular. It's, instead, it makes me very, very unpopular. This will change. But in the meantime, I'm so glad that you're here and paying attention, and I look forward to talking to you again next week. Bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye.